My name is Michael Stone, and this is the Speaking Up for Safety podcast sponsored by the Utah Labor Commission. Today, I am joined by Joy Glad as well as Matt Pennington. I'm going to turn time over to them to introduce themselves and kind of what their role is here and what the podcast is going to be about. So, Joy. Um, well, hi, I'm Joy Glad. I'm Director of Operations here at the Utah Safety Council and a business owner here in uh, Utah. And I'm here just to learn as much as I can and ask some questions from you. Well, thanks for having me. I'm Matt Pennington. I'm the state security chief of the new division of state security with DPS. Excellent. And today we're actually going to be talking about the uh, the Guardians program that's in Utah right now, which I feel like currently has a lot of uh, misconceptions surrounding it. And people may have some unanswered questions when it comes to exactly what the program entails. I mean, I personally have read a lot of uh, different bills out there and even I sometimes get lost in the exact text and what things are going to. So that's why we brought Matt on today to kind of clear up some of those misconceptions and throw some questions his way. So if you would, um, what was the primary motivation behind the Guardians program and kind of how it was conceived to begin with? Yeah, sure. So a lot of this legislation was drafted before I was even hired, right? This all was being started before I took this job in January. But as I've worked through the process and got to know uh, the bill in depth. The, the Guardian program is misconstrued in the sense of everyone thinks it's this volunteer in a school. That's not what it is. The, the law requires that there does have to be someone armed in the school, but they have three options. Uh, the school resource officer is an option. Private armed security that would go through some similar training as the Guardian training is an option. And if they don't want to do either of those two things or don't have access to those two things, then they certainly can use the guardian option, which is an existing school employee, so not a volunteer. It's a voluntary program, meaning the employee does have to volunteer to be the guardian or want to be the guardian. And then there's a vetting out process. They have to be selected by the school administration and the district. Then they have to go through a mental health screening and then ultimately go to a guardian training program, which is in the law as well as far as the base requirements for that. But this misconception that this is an outside volunteer from the community coming in for $500. That's blatantly false. That's not accurate. So it's, it's already an existing school employee who volunteers to participate. And that's just, again, one of three options that the local education agency has to comply with the law. Okay, excellent. And what do you imagine is going to change as far as the safety landscape of a school is concerned by having that guardian or the SRO or um, the armed security force being there? Yeah, sure. Well, here's another thing that people don't tend to think about or realize. There's been guns in schools in Utah for 30 years legally. Uh, 1997, Utah Supreme Court made a ruling that you can't restrict concealed firearm permit holders from carrying a weapon on public property. That includes schools. So since 1997, you have administrators, staff, teachers carrying guns. Um, you can look at a bunch of national studies that relate to planned active attacks states that typically are allowing teachers to be armed don't have them quite frankly uh, what this law essentially does is say okay well if you're already going to carry a gun and what we've seen in a now georgia 133 planned attacks post columbine on school grounds 40 plus percent of the time a teacher or staff tries to intervene you know all the stuff coming out of georgia is preliminary right now but there's two staff members killed uh, my guess is, based on historical relevancy, that at least one of them was probably trying to do something or intervene mm -hmm. and got hurt or killed. So we are already seeing that. We have for 25 years post-Columbine. So if teachers or staff already have a guardian mentality or mindset of you're not going to hurt my kids on my watch, including bus drivers, when we interact with bus drivers, they have a similar mentality, mm -hmm. then great. If you're going to carry a gun and you already have the mentality, let us train you. And then the $500 stipend is just to provide them with some resources to go buy a more comfortable holster to upgrade their equipment, to buy ammo, you know, whatever that may get them. But this messaging out there that we're getting outside volunteers and we're going to pay them $500 in totality for a year, like I said, that's just, it's not accurate, it's false. So unfortunately, we have some recent example of how it's effective. You know, Georgia, a student enters the campus, has a gun. He's there until second period when he goes to a bathroom and assembles the weapon and comes back. They activate their panic 
devices in the school, which puts the entire school into lockdown and notifies the SROs that are on campus. Uh, that law is also a part of this law, right? It lists as law with the panic alert devices. The SROs respond, and as soon as this person is confronted, they give up, which is what we've seen in all active shooter events. We did a podcast a couple of years ago on active shooter events, right? And we talked about when they're confronted, especially with an armed confrontation, they at least stop killing innocent people. And so that's what this concept is really about, is have an SRO, have a private armed security guard in there, and or the guardian that's a, already a school employee who's willing and go confront this attacker and stop the violence, right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I have a question about logistics. Sure. Um, from the things that I have been reading, this is supposed to be implemented this year. It's, yeah, no. The studies are supposed to be completed by the end of this year of Correct. what you needed, um, where your deficiencies are. With only having a $100 million one-time uh, fund for a grant for this, you're looking at finding where your def deficiencies are, picking the people that are going to be putting in there. That includes their background checks, their psychology, which their information is not allowed to be crammed. So I can't find mm -hmm. out anything about who's in my school with a gun. Um, my school. I don't go to school. My kid does, though. Um, the training that they have to go to, which is only 28 hours long. Mm -hmm. So how logistically are we going to make sure that the people coming into our schools to be those guardians are going to be sufficiently trained? Like I, I have been trained to go into the fray. That is where some of my training has come from. And mm -hmm. I don't know in a situation like that whether I would be able to do that and, and not be able to, yeah, that I would flee instead of fight. Sure. So how do, how do those logistics fit into there to make sure that we have the right people and that they're trained properly? Yeah, so there's a lot in your question. Um, there is a lot. I'm sorry. We can break <laughs> it down. <laughs> You're fine. The, the money issue, that's one-time funding. The, the that's up to the legislature. We don't control any of that. Uh, obviously each LEA or school district has their own taxing entity. They can certainly start to figure out other options if they don't want the guardian. Like I mentioned, let's not forget, they can certainly try and fund a school resource officer. They can certainly try and fund private armed security, roughly bell to bell. That's 30 hours a week. That's a part-time employee cost. So everyone's focusing on the guardian. That is not the only option. I'll start with that. As far as the needs assessment, yep, yeah, they do have a needs assessment that is comprehensive of policy, procedure, site, facility, all these things. That's to identify gaps and where they're at right now because, quite honestly, uh, their gaps have been underreported or just ignored. Well, the for a smaller long time. the community, the larger the gap, also. And it depends. There is some small communities that have done a very um, good job at being proactive in security measures. Okay. So that depends. So, the funding comes from a grant perspective. You had grant funding last year that was similar out of House Bill 61 that was going to be distributed the same way. The grant funding this year is really broken up into two parts. You have the school safety center that's controlling roughly half of it, and that will be distributed the same way as it was with House Bill 61. You have the school security task force that will control the other half, and that money will come from broad scale things. So, for example, the guardian identifier, right? We approved of the task force that that will be funded through task force money so that that can be controlled and not accessible to the public. You mentioned the grandma requirement. That's for their own protection so that people can't have a planned attack knowing who the guardian is. As far as your, your background checks and all of that, that's all done through the concealed firearm permit process. The BCI does a weekly wrap back on all CFP holders. So if something comes up, they're flagged. Uh, your training comes from a mix of input from stakeholders around the state via law enforcement, education. Uh, we talked to Texas and Florida who have similar programs. And so that standard of 28 hours, that's a minimum standard. So think about law enforcement. We have to have 40 hours of training annually to keep our certification. Mm -hmm. That's a minimum standard. The county and or local agency, if they want to participate with the educators and put them through 80 hours of training, they certainly can do so. What we're saying from my office, because I'm responsible for approving all these training curriculums, is these are the base standards that comply with the law. You can't do less than this. This is the minimum. 
There is annual training requirements. There's biannual training requirements. So there is ongoing training if they do go with the Guardian program. Uh, this training is also required if they go armed private security, whichever guards are being identified would have to go through this training as well. The law enforcement agency has the ultimate say in participation, meaning if they get somebody into the training, they're like, there's no way, no how. They freeze. They run instead of fight. Uh, they can kick them out of the program. So that's the vetting out process to make sure the right person is participating. Okay. Um Mental health is a big issue mm -hmm. uh, nowadays. Is some of the training going to be, so I, I don't know what the cur curriculum for the 28 hours mm -hmm. required is. Is there going to be something in there on de-escalation? Yeah, that's mandated in the law. So you can look at the law and see Yeah, that's the Utah state laws is. required for, for peace officers. Is no. that going to be required for that? So if you look up the Guardian law, it lays out what the initial annual and biannual training requires. Okay. And that is part of it, is the de-escalation piece. Okay. So. So, and that's honestly, here's part of the frustration as we go around and talk about it. People hear a bunch of rumors and they just assume things. Nobody's actually reading the law, it seems. And so I would encourage people, if you want to know what the law says, go read it. It is a very big bill and it covers an awful lot of stuff. It does. But if you want to know what's going on, I would start there. I guess that's just so my, my does, take So the $100 million that. that they've set aside, that goes for um, fire code, bullying, hazing, cyberbullying, communication, panic alerts, video surveillances, things like that. So there's a, blot, a bunch of codes that there was some verbiage changed or some responsibility changed that relate to all of that, but that's not the major part of what they're doing. So the okay, fire so, code, so for the example, most, The majority is, of the money is not going to be going to those. It will be going towards... So the majority of the money, in my guess, and I don't know, this is going to be awarded through School Safety Center and then a task force discussion. The major three things that are in the bill, if you really break it down, the 92 pages, is Alyssa's Law, which is panic alerts mm -hmm. required for every classroom, the security film, and then access control for secure vestibule, single point of entry, uh, video cameras on entryways and exits. And then your your guardian program. Those are the three big things. Big things. Yeah. Okay. And so when you look at widespread funding, my guess is that's where most of it will go. Um, you'd have to ask School Safety Center where the funding went from last year's funds. But again, talking about grandma request restriction, it's also it's against the law to disseminate information on the guardian's identity. It's also against the law for them to disseminate information on security gaps. So if they start talking about gaps in their needs assessment, that's that's against the law. Yes. They can't do that. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Perfect. And from what I could tell, there's 1,200 schools in Utah, right? Approximately. Yeah. Approximately, yeah. And I don't know if it's maybe too early for the data to show this. Like, how many of them are opting for like their SRO versus the armed security versus the guardian? Yeah, so it's way too early for that. I mean, we're still in the process of them conducting their needs assessments. Uh, there's about 270 SROs currently in the state, but that has been the case for a number of years now. Uh, the discussion, a lot of them are trying to fund or look at funding SROs, additional SROs. Uh, the rest of them are looking at other options, whether that be uh, the armed security option or kind of trying to contract out with their sheriff's office for different options. So a lot of that's still coming. But keep in mind, again, this is all brand new. So you had mentioned the law is in effect, but implementation, those are two different words. The law went into effect in May. We certainly know the implementation. There's a runway to that, right? Because of funding, because yes. of this needs assessment, identifying what we really need. So we don't, I guess we don't know that yet to answer your question. So if the needs assessment is due at the end of this year. What is the next mm -hmm. viable step after that? So once the needs assessment comes in, that's where School Safety Center will evaluate all that. They can certainly um, apply for approved alternatives, which are... In the law, there's four areas where they can ask for an alternative. The person that's filling the role of the safety security director, think of that as like a district level or if you have a charter with multiple locations, that's a person at a, okay. a high level. You have the safety and security specialist that's in each individual school. So there's some restrictions in the law of who that can be or who it can't be. And this is last year's law. That's, this isn't even this year's law. This was before my time. Um, they can ask for exceptions to that. Then the exceptions are for the guardian who can participate or be the guardian and or the armed security requirement. Those are the four areas they can ask for approved alternatives. So once the needs assessments come in, we'll evaluate all those requests for approved alternatives and make some decisions there. 
they'll ask for funding. Uh, that's where School Safety Center and the task force will look at, you know, is everyone asking for this same thing? So, for example, panic alerts. Like yes. We know that everyone has to have one. So is everyone asking for it? Do we fund that on the task force side? And then on the school safety center side, are they what are they going to choose to fund? Are they asking for door locks? Are they asking for personnel funding for a temporary basis? You know, things like that. So that's how that will be evaluated once the needs assessments come in and we understand what we're dealing with. So when you talk about implementation, you know, like full-fledged implementation, you're talking school year 25, 26 or after. Okay. Like some of these things are capital improvement projects, yes. right? You're talking about building redesign. You're talking about, I mean, millions of dollars in infrastructure. infrastructure, yes. yes. And so we know from my level that this is going to take time. Um, my office is also responsible for setting date requirements for existing buildings to become compliant. Your comment about the fire code, that relates to new buildings or remodeled buildings. In the past, you would have to have the fire marshal sign yes. off that you're compliant. Well, now that also has to be signed off on by my office. So, okay. for example, if they go build a new school, um, you know, I'll just be upfront about it. There's this whole like glass classroom concept that has taken hold. Uh, well, that's problematic since the state before, again, in my time, adopted standard response protocol, which includes lockdown. Yes. And if you can't lock down that classroom because it's all glass, that becomes a problem. It's a so trap. They're, so they're going to have to figure out how to remedy that in future years. If they're building a school post the bill passing, uh, we're not going to approve that architecture plan, if that makes sense. Okay. No, that, that's good to know. So, mm -hmm. um, you talked about the, the school security something. What was the third word in there? Well, there's two things. There's a safety and security director, and then there's a um, – School safety specialist. Mm, it was the safety school something with a C. School safety center. Yeah, that one. Would you mm. explain that one to me, please? Uh, so that's with State Board of Education. That's been existent for since 2019 legislation. So since 2020, that's been in place. That comprised of a multidisciplinary team of stakeholders from State Board of Education. There's a liaison from my office that's been a part of that team from DPS for the last four years. They have someone from Office of Substance Use Mental Health there. Uh, you have someone, I believe, from Safe UT there. So that's a multidisciplinary okay. team. And that's being run by State Board of Education. Okay. Just trying to figure out where all the players lie and how they all fit into the yeah. puzzle. Sure. Yeah. yeah. One thing I was thinking of, because uh, you kind of explained all the different things that are being added in this bill, such as the uh, secured entryways, the alarms, and then finally the guardians. So basically it's like kind of a multifaceted program where there's more mm -hmm. deterrence in the way in order to try to make it almost like the guardian truly is the last line of defense. That's exactly what it is. And that's how the law is written is they shouldn't be doing anything unless there's a substantial threat to human life. So this isn't somebody that's a hall monitor that's intervening in a fist fight, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what they're there for. Uh, they're only there if someone's trying to substantially hurt or kill other people. Okay. So, so in my mind, I'm just thinking of like the steps that occur. So obviously they'd have to identify the individual who's trying to hurt people. They would sound the alarm and ideally they're probably outside the premises, just given the fact that they have the one way secured entryway to the school or. Yeah, no. Okay. No. I mean, what, what you've seen in 600 active shooter attacks post Columbine is you can flip a coin on their connection to the building. When we talk about commerce and just all areas, right? Yeah. If you look at just educational institutions, again, 133 now with Georgia, in elementary schools, it's always been an outside actor. We've had eight of those coming from the outside. And so when you talk about elementaries, the focus should be perimeter security, secure vestibules, uh, making sure good visitor management practices, right? When you talk about middle, high school, higher ed, 95% of the time, it's a student or former student. So they're inside the building. So no, I mean, they're not most mm -hmm. likely going to be outside the building, unfortunately. Yeah. They're already going to be in. And so that's, again, we can talk about all these perimeter security things and visitor management, but look at Georgia. I mean, he walked right through the front door with a backpack on and was in class for a full period, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we see over and over and over again, at least in middle schools, high schools, uh, even college campuses tend to be students. So. 
we do have to take that into account. We have to focus on human behavior and teaching people what to do during drills, making sure they understand classroom defense and lockdown, and hence why the glass classrooms are a problem. The alerting process, that's not coming from the guardian. That's why every person in a classroom, somebody in the classroom has to have a wearable panic alert. They will go straight to the dispatch center or to law enforcement. Depending on what system they integrate, it certainly can notify the entire school like it did in Georgia, um, which put everyone else into lockdown. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we, it doesn't happen. Hopefully through uh, good messaging and campaigns and different things within the school environment, we identify these threats beforehand and we don't just assess them and let them go. We continue to monitor or manage them. Uh, so we don't get to this point. You know, if we identify someone on the pathway to violence early, we need to stay involved in that to make sure they get off of it, or at least they don't have the means to do it. And, you know, you can look at studies through around the country. Those are some of the failures is we do identify it and then we miss it or we miss the warning signs, right? Like it's mm -hmm. right in front of our face. And then we go back after the fact and we're like, man, if somebody would have just caught that or if somebody would have said something like that's the hope, you know, all this stuff we're talking about with the guardian, like that's after the X, like mm -hmm. it's too late. We missed it. Yeah. If the guardian is having to act like we missed something. Right. Mm -hmm. And now hopefully the guardian minimizes casualty, but the inception of the event, like that already happened. And that's the unfortunate thing is we can talk about all these security measures and things that we're doing after the X, but what we should be focusing on with community involvement, parent involvement, student involvement, is how do we prevent it before the X, if that makes sense? Yeah, like early intervention. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there a way in the future that AI could become involved in this? Yeah, AI is interesting. Um, I, w I guess I view technology as a performance enhancer, right? Not to say it's you dismiss tool, it. Yes. Yeah, it's just a tool. I certainly think... I, don't know, I was quoted in the media recently talking about before the X, you know, weapon detection coming into school. Not yes, necessarily. You did. That was the quote that I'm reading from. Yeah, not necessarily um, metal detectors as we see them. But if you go to a football game, you go to a concert, you go to any sporting event, you're walking through a weapons detection AI software, right? That's changed like it's no longer a magnetrometer yes. like they're detecting all kinds of things well yeah they test for plastics now and things yeah. like that too so and a lot of these detection systems actually are picking up more contraband than they are guns in facilities that have them um but again we'll just because of the recency we'll use georgia if they have that and somebody detects hey there's a gun in that backpack and we go confront that individual on our terms in a tactical way you know, that doesn't, he doesn't have the opportunity to go assemble the gun and go commit a shooting. Like we already identified it, you know, and then there's all this conversation about mental health of students and this, that, and the other. Well, I have a kid in school as well. And we go to football games all the time and we go to concerts and we travel in the airport. And he certainly does not have PTSD through going through a weapons detection system. So I think we have to consider that because we're talking about planned active attacks. You've heard me say 133 a couple of times now. Well, let's just take that out of the equation. Like, let's talk about just violence in schools. You've had 2,500 shootings in schools post Columbine. Mm -hmm. So do we really care if it's a planned attack or if it's two kids that are getting in an argument in the hall and one of them pulls a gun and shoots the other one and shoots three other innocent people because they happen to be standing nearby? Like, should we treat that differently? Um, in my opinion, no, we shouldn't. We should look at how do we keep it out of the school, mm -hmm. right? How do we prevent the violence to begin with? So I think, again, you talk about multiple layers. There's not a one-size-fits-all answer, unfortunately. It's a, it's a layered approach. It's going to take a while to get us there. But if you've heard me speak in the past, I relate it to, you know, the fire service. In 1958, we have a school fire, and it's tragic. It kills nearly 100 people, right? Well, within 10 years, we changed the entire country. We double the cost of construction. We train everybody. There's fire alarms. Everybody knows that if you catch on fire, you do what? Stop, drop, and roll. Has anyone in your professional <laughs> life had you train that or do that? Like, does John have you stop, drop, and roll four <laughs> times a year? Uh, well, to be honest with you, I'm an ex-firefighter, and I never even did it then. Exactly. So prove my point, but you still remember it. I do. And no one in law enforcement has trained me to do it in 21 years either. But I still remember it because we were taught that in K through 12. 
And so now what we do know is these violent attacks are happening again and again and again and again. And so it's time to treat it like we did the fire service. It's time to train people what to do. It's time to put things in place that slow or down or mitigate it. Being in the fire side, you probably understand burn through rate and all these doors have some type of rating yes. or windows or whatever, right? And then we went one step further and we said, well, there has to be a hydrant accessible with an X amount of feet and there has to be a fire station mm-hmm. accessible with an X amount of minute response time. That's our national standards. Yes, they are. And so, but yet for 25 years post Columbine, we've just been like, eh, well, I mean, I don't know, do whatever you want. You know, and, and in my opinion, it's time for that to change. And at least here in Utah, that's our goal is in 5, 10, 15, 20 years when I'm, you know, hopefully my grandkids are in school, just like they know what to do during a fire drill or if they catch on fire, they're going to know what to do if there's a violent attack that happens. Is there any future uh, vision of this to become not just a reactive way with that that small amount of of proactiveness against uh, guns in school? Is there is there going to be something that comes after that that's going to be more um, institutional or more um, proactive in our approach with people here in Utah to have no guns in schools? Um, uh, well, I'm not sure I explained that clearly. Yeah, I'll just say this. I I don't know where you stand on the gun control debate. I here nor there, but I'll tell you this. We got to stop arguing about it. It just divides people and we don't get anywhere. We just Agreed. stay stuck. Think of guns like fire. It just happens, right? So when it happens, we need to know, we need to train people on what to do. If it happens, we need to understand how to slow it down. And then we need to understand how to respond to it. And so that's the approach. That's what we should be focusing on, this keeping guns out. Like I mentioned at the beginning, like guns have been in schools for 30 years. And that's not changing, not at least in my lifetime, I don't think, here in Utah. Um, But even a national narrative of this gun control debate, like I agree with some of it. I disagree with other parts of it. But we're not getting rid of it. Like it's going to happen. So rather than standing on both sides of the fence, yelling at each other about who's right or who's wrong, Let's figure out how to mitigate it and respond to it. Like, let's figure out how to train people on what to do if or when it happens. Again, similar to the fire approach, right? Like, mm-hmm. We already have this. Um, well, know, the reason I ask is just, because I talked to a couple lawmakers and a couple um, elected officials mm-hmm. in the last couple of days, and they're looking at the future. Mm-hmm. You know, this this seems to be a stepping stone, and it's a great stepping stone in the right direction. But what comes next? Yeah, I mean, I think you will see school safety legislation continue. Um, You know, this bill is probably the most comprehensive school safety bill passed around the country without a tragedy happening first. A lot of it is being modeled after Florida and or Texas, who've had tragedies, unfortunately. Um, As far as what's coming in the future, I think we we have to focus on, again, before the X. You know, how how are we dealing with intervention before the X? You know, we talk about, I go around and speak about all these things, but I include youth involvement, which isn't part of the law, but who knows the school is better than we do. That's my next question. Uh, The kids know. The kids know what doors unlock. The kids know who's got drugs. The kids know who's got a gun. The kids know who's sloughing. And so. My kid can get in through the back door. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) And, And we do know that the kids want to be involved. Like, you know, they want to be involved in their own safety in their own community and have buy-in. And so again, this goes back to drills, making sure they're done effectively, making sure they're not done at a convenient time, but in a realistic time, that's going to train them what to do. This goes back to the whole, see something, say something, having a, either a safety club, a culture, a campaign, whatever, whatever the schools want to do, but they have to include the youth in the conversation. The other part of it is there's really three stakeholders in getting all this done. Obviously law enforcement's involved in the training and tracking and response. And then you got the schools involved in the majority of the implementation, but the community, you know, as a parent, if we don't have community buy-in, then none of this is getting done. You know, you go back to Sir Robert Pill had his principles of modern policing, which quite frankly, if we would just follow today, we'd be much better off. Um, But one of those in summary essentially was if you don't have the trust and respect of the public, you can't go out and do your job. This is the same thing. Yes. If, as, if as parents, we don't support this, 
it's hard to well, just as a citizen of my community if i don't trust it and i don't believe right. that this is going to do a good job i'm i'm not going to buy into it which right. means i'm not going to support what's going on because yeah. a lot of that, that's my taxpayers dollars that are mm-hmm. going to it so yeah and the ongoing funding is a, a big conversation right and again that's for your your state legislatures to to figure out what that's going to look like i can tell you how other states fund it um, but that's obviously a hot topic that everyone brings up is the funding so well the whole thing's a hot topic so i'm sure. impressed that you've taken mm-hmm. this on well somebody had to do it True. <laughs> yeah and are you currently in the process of incorporating feedback from some of those stakeholders who have voiced concerns potentially yeah i mean that's what my job's been for eight and a half months aside from trying to push things down the road is um traveling around the state and talking to different stakeholders, right, and input. Um, But again, a lot of this stuff that's coming, I mean, this legislation all happened in January, February. Like There was a time and place for people to voice their concerns with their representatives and with their um, local politicians. And now that the bill's passed, you know, our responsibility now is how do we figure out how to implement it the correct way? And you go to any type of change management, right? So we formed it. We're in the middle of storming. And before we ever get to normalization, we certainly will look at what's working and what's not working. And like I mentioned, I think that you'll see legislation pass every single year, whether that's additional measures, whether that's cleanup language or, you know, changing something that maybe was was done or worded poorly. I think that you'll continue to see that. Yeah. What sort of uh, metrics, uh, metrics of success are you guys trying to look at in this overall program? Because you talked about early intervention and just honestly trying to eliminate, you know, school shootings as a whole, what besides those sort of items are you guys looking at to say, yes, we're, we're doing it, we're succeeding? Well, you obviously have some KPIs when it comes to compliance with the law, like what measures are being done. So we'll come out with a, a Utah version of the needs assessment, which will incorporate kind of best practices from some of these national assessment tools. Um, State Board of Education wants to bring in some culture climate type questions when it relates to like student services, different access, things like that the mental health side of it. So as we start to track those and we have, you know, common points that we can look at and see trends and data in, you know, we'll we'll have an idea of where we're at in implementation, but you kind of said it. I mean, the real benchmark is we continue to not have one here in Utah. And quite frankly, we've been lucky. There's been several credible averted attacks in Utah that people just don't hear about. Mm-hmm. And so what I will say is hiding and hoping is not a plan. We have to do something. And I know there's a bunch of unknowns and I know it might not be perfectly written for everybody, but sitting here just saying, eh, it's not going to happen here. Like that's not the answer. I mean, Utah actually is the perfect demographic for what you see happening around the country. You know, so. So as somebody who is in your position, um, when you find things that aren't working well or that can be improved, are you going to fight for those changes? Well, I'm just one voice on the task force, right? Um, so there's certainly your one convert- voice can make a change for sure. And I certainly think that because of my position and role, I do have, um, I don't know if influence is the right word, but I do think my we'll opinion, sway. Yeah. My, I would <laughs> say that I do feel like my opinion matters. Um, And so, yeah, certainly I I look at things from a logical standpoint of how does this work in the real world? How do we balance the likelihood that it's going to happen, which is very, very low. But if it does happen, it's catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And how do we be a good steward of taxpayer dollars as we start to implement all this? You know, so for example, let's use the security film. Um, Some of these schools have a four foot wall and the entire building's glass. Like that's going to get really expensive, like very, very fast. Very quickly, yes. But if we use data to our advantage and we use known attacks and we use human behavior and psychology, what we do understand, we call it the OODA loop in the Mm -hmm. law enforcement world. Uh, We do understand that if people are stuck in the two O's in the observe and orient and they don't ever get the opportunity to decide and act, that they tend to give up pretty quickly. So when we start talking about secure vestibules and security film and ground level windows, you know, do we define that as anything accessible below six feet do we design that as you know the vestibule and x amount of feet on either side of the vestibule knowing that 
human behavior, they tend to psychologically give up after a period of time. Right? Yeah. And or we do know, at least in a metropolitan area, the response time for law enforcement is about three minutes. So whether law enforcement responds from the outside or whether they respond from the inside or the guardian responds from the inside, the hope is we combat that pretty quickly and they give up. So I look at things at a logical standpoint in that way. And so there's certain things in the bill right now that I will recommend at least verbiage changes, not necessarily pieces of it going away, but just how it's functioning. Okay. You know? So like from the fire service, you're probably familiar with like BDAs or like the distributor antenna systems within yeah. buildings, right? So part of the law, again, this goes back to the fire code piece is it says those have to be in during construction. Well, what I've learned in talking to kind of subject matter experts is we don't know what the signal loss is until the building's up. Like you don't know what the RF loss is until there's walls and yeah. all kinds of obstacles in the way. So to do that during construction, it could be a waste of taxpayer money because they're expensive. And with the change to the communication system, going to L3 Harris and technology, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, we're probably more prudent to do a test after construction, but pre-occupancy and then remedy whatever problem we have at that point. So there's things like that that I run into or see or, or get educated on that, you know, I'll make recommendations when we meet to, hey, we should fix this type of thing. Um, I think that, you know, the red representative that has run the bill the last couple of years is very receptive to most of those things. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, I do have a quick question and this goes back a little bit. This might be a very easy answer. We talked about the, um, the alarms mm -hmm. that everybody's having with the personal alarms. Is that going to go to an office or is that going to go out to VEC dispatch? So it's designed, the intent of it is to go directly to dispatch okay. now. So Valley Emergency Communications Center back, right? Well, here in Salt Lake yeah. Valley. I mean, you have two PSAPs you in do, Salt Lake. Yes. You have Salt Lake City and you got VEC. Um, but around the state, you know, keep in mind this is statewide implementation. So so they're nearest 911. Yeah, yeah, dispatch center. Uh, depending on the technology or vendor they decide to go with. I mean, there, there are vendors that have options where it's, you know, a long press to get to dispatch and a short press to get to like the office. Like okay. there are... So there are options. Technology, there's options, yeah. Um, but the design of the wearable one in the classroom is to get an emergency response from public safety. Okay. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know that was backstepping a little bit, but thank you. <laughs> no, it's okay. You. you guys can edit it and make it. <laughs> there you go. Right? They can Theme edit science. it. Yeah. yeah. And are there any, like, uh, common rumors or myths you've heard where people are just kind of misinformed, and what would those be, and what's the response you'd give? Well, we kind of talked about that earlier, the – you know, the biggest misconception that I'm hearing is this volunteer guardian for $500. Like, it's just, that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, like I mentioned earlier, it's an existing school employee who, quite frankly, should already have the mentality that they're willing to go. To your point, we don't know what we don't know, even in law enforcement or fire, right? However, I would say this, you know, Michael, like, how much money is it for me to give you to go outside and get in a gunfight right now? Let's see, 71000 that's okay. it. Yeah. I mean, I signed up for <laughs> I'm looking I, up in billions here. Like I signed yeah. up for $14 an hour 20 years ago. Yeah. Like that was my number. That's current going rate for hire. So that's right. why it's 71. Yeah. So <laughs> if, you, if you want to be a cop and you're already willing to do it, it might be that. Mm -hmm. But for some people, there's no amount of money, right? Maybe generational money where you're like, okay, I'll go kill myself for generational wealth for my kids <laughs> and grandkids. Like, I don't know. But for the most part, there's no amount of money. And so when people focus on that, I said, stop focusing on the money. Like, if these people already don't have the mindset that they're going to go towards harm, there's no amount of money that's going to convince them to do it. It doesn't matter if it's $500 or $500 million. There's no amount of money, yeah. right? So again, this misconception that we're trying to convince people to come do this for $500, that is not accurate. We want the right person. And quite frankly, if you get somebody coming in the door saying, hey, I want to do this because you're paying me, we don't want that person. Probably not the right person. We want the person that's going to act regardless of whether they're being paid or not because that's who they are. And again, in the education world, that's what we've seen around the country. We see educators step up and hold the line and try to intervene. They just don't have the tools and resources or training to do it effectively. And in Utah, again, there's been guns in schools for 30 years. So let's train them appropriately if they want to carry a gun. And if they're all ready to carry a gun to school because they want to protect themselves or others, then great. Let's train them. 
The stipend, again, is just a small piece that will allow them to go upgrade whatever equipment, ammunition, buy a new gun, you know, whatever that might be. That's the biggest misconception is this whole program. Um, and I'll say it again, it's not the only option. They certainly can go partner with their local law enforcement agency and try and get a school resource officer. If they don't want that, they certainly can go to a local armed security company and vet out an armed guard to be there. They do not have to use a guardian, but that's what everyone wants to focus on. Mm -hmm. And with that armed guard that they'd be potentially hiring, would they be in charge of then doing like all the, the background check, like evaluation, or would they kind of kick the can to your department and say, hey, we want to get this guy? No. So if they go and enter into an agreement with a company, it would be like any other business. Uh, the company is the one that vets them out. There is security guard licensing process through Doppel here in Utah. There are certain requirements. And again, the guards would have to go through the guardian training. So the local law enforcement agency doing the guardian training could still say, whether it's an armed security guard or not, they could still say this person doesn't belong in the program. We are not signing off on them. Okay. You know, so there's still a, a vetting out process, even if they do go with armed private security. Okay. May I ask a devil's advocate question? Of course. So some people that I had been talking to about this brought this one to my attention, and I'm going to use an allegory of the police department. Our police officers are there to protect and serve, right? But they go above and beyond that dealing with things that officers should not be dealing with, like mental health and these other side parts that aren't necessarily what you would consider to be a police officer's primary job sure. so now you're asking and i'm not you i'm using this as like the, the queen's week kind of thing sure um you're now asking teachers who have an awful lot on their plate already to also take on weapons to guard children with does that make you feel uncomfortable at all that you're asking them to that i mean they're already working 60 hour weeks now they've got to do this on top of it yeah well two things one the law says it shouldn't be the principal or a teacher. Uh, the reason for that okay, is... I did miss that part when I read it then. Okay. I'm the, glad you clarified. The, the reason for that is because the principal, in the event of an incident, should be a part of unified command and help get to stability and resolution and recovery. So we certainly don't want them involved in the critical incident, right? Uh, teacher's responsibility, and it has been the entire time they've been a teacher, is classroom safety and instruction and keeping track of the kids, right? So we don't want them leaving the kids unattended with no direction to go out and intervene in an incident. Oh, yeah. My kid would be out in the hall going, what can I do to help? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, with that said, it is one of the approved alternatives. So you get schools that are like, well, we only have a staff of five and it's a principal, four teachers and a part-time secretary, right? So, and the secretary doesn't want to do it. So, but we have a teacher that wants to do it. Well, they can approve, they can ask for an approved alternative. Our, my, I guess, philosophy would be we'd rather have somebody than nobody. Okay. But this concept of are we asking them to do that? No, it's a voluntary program. No, nobody's asking them to do anything. Um, we're telling the school and the district that, hey, you have to identify a solution. Has to happen. But if they have nobody in their school that wants to do it, they certainly can go try and fund an SRO. And okay. I get money is tough. But we all have budgets and That's, we all figure yeah. out how to make ends meet. Like sometimes you go without McDonald's because you got to make a car payment. You know, like it just is what it is. And I think the state will certainly look at a funding mechanism ongoing, but everyone just wants to be like, well, you moved my cheese and I can't afford it because I can't cut this or that or this. Like, well, if it's important to you, you can. You can figure it out. Like these are smart people. And so it doesn't have to be a teacher. We're not asking teachers to do anything. Okay. It's a voluntary program. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just looking over my questions. No, you're good. I think you've answered most of them just kind of tangentially through like different answers you've had. One of the questions I did have, and you could have probably already answered this, is uh, basically – do you think the students are going to be more fearful potentially just from the rhetoric from their parents saying that, Hey, there's going to be someone in your school with a gun now watch out for that. I mean, I can't speculate on that again. I'll just go back to our kids scared now, knowing that their teachers had a gun on them for the last 30 years. Like yeah. probably not like my son doesn't care if somebody has got a gun in there. The only thing he cares is if another kid has a gun that's trying to hurt him. Right. Mm -hmm. Adults having guns. I mean, we live in Utah. 
Yeah. Everybody has a gun. So are we scared going to the mall? But there's a thousand people walking past you with a gun. Like, I don't think so. You know, I think no understanding youth and their mental health, if we paint a narrative for them, could we certainly convince them that they should be scared? Yes. But that goes back to messaging. That goes back to community support and involvement. Um, like this is a good thing. I don't know why everyone's like, well, this is really scary. Like, do we just forget we live in Utah? Like no. there's guns in schools. There has been for a long time mm-hmm. and they have no training. Have you ever been through a concealed firearm class? I'm not. Well, it is not training. Mm-hmm. It is not training. <laughs> <laughs> so like that should scare you more than the guardian program. Yeah. Quite honestly. Um, the other thing that people aren't talking about, there was another bill that passed called the educator protector program that is for teachers again, voluntary. But if the teachers have a valid CFP and they want to go through some training, um, it's not as comprehensive as the guardian training, but they can go through the educator protector pro- okay. program training, which is um, essentially firearm safety handling and scenarios. Okay. So. Excellent. Do you have any additional? No, I'm good. That was great. Yeah. Okay. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for joining Hopefully us. Hopefully, it's uh, beneficial. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. It cleared up a lot of misconceptions for. I'm sure a lot of people here even because some people are kind of going, you know, hot and heavy on it as far as like, oh, this is a program well, that's demonized for these like, reasons. Like but, I said earlier, I mean, people hear things from neighbors or coworkers or friends or family. Like, here, here's the interesting part being in, in law enforcement is the majority of things in the Utah code book, uh, ignorance is not a defense. So just because you didn't take time to go read the law that speeding is illegal doesn't mean you can go out and speed. And so I would encourage people, especially if it's affecting you or your children, like, go read the law, see what's in it. You know, and is it written perfectly? No, it's not. Will we, again, evaluate and get there and change things that need to be changed? Absolutely. You know, it's not, at least I don't approach things in a black and white um, stance. So This is why we picked subject matter experts mm-hmm. to talk exactly. to. Yeah. <laughs> we want the right information. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me. Oh. No. Mm-hmm. Excellent. I'll turn the uh, time over to Joy to close us out because I suck at closing out of these podcasts as has been Fair identified enough. and all the ones I've been on. <laughs> uh, well, as like, I've like, never closed one out before, um, thank you, Mr. Stone, for putting all of this together. I appreciate that. Um, Matt Pennington, uh, thank you for being here. Mm-hmm. We are, are very grateful for you to share the information and help uh, fix some of these misconstrued ideas that we've all had or yeah. may have had or may come across. Sure. Um, so that was very good information, and I appreciate you taking the time to come here and, and talk with us. Yeah, so. happy to do so. So thank you for having All me. Right. And I, I will also say thank you to the team and everybody here for helping get this uh, podcast taken care of. Stay safe.